have been many queens in the Caucasus, but none have been so celebrated as the 12th century queen Tamar of Georgia. Tamar possessed such wisdom and a lofty mind that during her reign, not one man was punished by lashing. She who could bring fear and terror to her enemies, and who was humble with the humble, reigned pacifically and joyfully in her state and domain. No man has ever seen anybody who could so easily subdue another man regardless of his will, and so thoroughly control human obduracy and opposition. There are many engaging stories about Queen Tamar, but the documented evidence about her is patchy, not unlike the ancient frescoes which depict her. I'm Bridget Kendall, and in this forum from the BBC World Service, we're going to piece together the story of this colourful Queen of the Caucasus, peering behind the image of her handed down to us in eulogies and on church walls to try to understand what she might have been like. I'm joined by four experts to help me, Dr. Ekaterin Gedevanishvili, senior researcher at the National Centre for the History of Georgian Art in Tbilisi, the capital of Georgia. Alexander Amika Beridze, professor of history at Louisiana State University in the United States. Dr. Sandro Nikolaishvili, postdoctoral researcher at the University of Southern Denmark, who works on retracing connections between the Byzantine and Georgian worlds, and Donald Rayfield, Emeritus Professor of Russian and Georgian at Queen Mary, University of London, here in the UK. Welcome to all of you. To this day, Queen Tamar seems to play an important role in the way Georgians see their history and place in the world. So let me start by asking all of you, why is that? Just one sentence, please. Alex. It is because uh, for Georgians, Tamar's reign represents one of the most crucial moments in their history. A moment when the Georgian kingdom had reached its height, when it's extended boundaries far beyond traditional confines and ushered in a golden age of Georgian arts, literature and architecture. Yekaterin, what about you? What is very important for Georgian people, she was the ruler who combined the character of a ruler of big empire. And at the same time, she lived uh, uh, in a very simple way, according to the sources. And uh, even sources describe that sometimes she was leading her army with bare legs, without shoes. And what is also very important, she's donating to poor people uh, her own things made by her own hands. Donald. She completed the work of her forebears. She built a country which was at its largest ever. It stretched from the Caucasus to Armenia. It was a country where there was rule of law and yet people were not executed or flogged. It was prosperous because her conquest brought in all the taxation and loot that they could desire. And above all, she created a myth the chroniclers who wrote about her were in love with her, clearly, a, a myth of a perfect ruler, which every other ruler should try and match. Sandro, what about you? During Tamar's reign, Georgia um, state became the strongest and most formidable power in the Caucasus and northern part of the Near East, and that witnessed also unprecedented uh, scale of literary and cultural activities. So her reign was a threshold after which Georgian state uh, started to decline, never to regain a position and power uh, it had uh, during Tamar's reign. OK, well, let's remind those of our listeners who are unfamiliar with the Caucasus and Georgia just a bit about it. It's an ancient nation in the mountainous Caucasus region that lies between the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea, to the north of Iran, Armenia and Turkey, and to the south of Russia, with its own very distinct culture. And Donald, tell us, when does the idea of Georgia as a nation first emerge? Georgia is a kingdom that has existed really probably since the time of Alexander the Great. And its history has been well written ever since it became Christian in the fourth century. It's not always been called Georgia. Uh, in ancient times, it was called Iberia in the east and the western bit on the Black Sea was called Colchis. But the term Georgia has become general in the west because it's the way in which people heard the, the Persian and Turkic name from they called them Gurji, which originally meant land of wolves. 
the Georgians themselves didn't have a proper name for their country until the 11th century when they started to call it Sakartvelo, a place for Kartvelians, a place for Georgians to live in. And uh, that is the common name used by Georgians today. So this is the country that Queen Tamar came from. But as I've already said, piecing together the fragments we know about her is no easy task. What we do know about her comes mostly from chronicles written to praise her rather than assess her objectively. And the facts tend to be just snippets of information. So we don't even really know for sure when she was born. We think it was around 1160. But when she was crowned Queen of Georgia, that happened not once, but twice. First in 1178, when her father... George, or Georgi III, was still on the throne, and then again in 1184. Why was that, Alex? In 1177, when Tamar would have been about 17 years old, her father was confronted by a group of rebellious nobles who wanted to remove him from power in favour of the king's nephew, Demna, who was considered by many to be a legitimate royal heir. Now, Demna's claims seem to be uh, been used as a pretext by a group of powerful nobles led by influential Amir Spasalar or a high constable, Ivane Orbeli, who wanted to limit the monarchical power. George III was able to crush the revolt and embark on a crackdown campaign on the defined aristocratic clans. Now, George had no sons, and he understood well that after his passing, his heir presumptive daughter, Tamar, uh, might face a major challenge. So uh, Georgia had never had a female ruler before, and as a female, Tamar's succession to monarchical power would have been unprecedented. And George clearly feared that there would be some complications. So to ensure a smooth transition of power, he decided to bring his daughter into the government while he was still alive. And so in 1178, shortly after the uh, rebellion was crushed, Tamar was crowned as the co-ruler. And for the next six years, she was employed as her father's surrogate in the royal government, which um, I think would have given her a a direct, hands-on experience of what it was like to govern, to lead. Now, King George passed away in the spring of 1184, and his fears that his successor would face a challenge materialized to a certain degree. Despite George's efforts, the barons were still alive and well, and it is because of their political pressure that Tamar, who, as we have seen, was already crowned, had to submit to an unusual second coronation ceremony in which she was ritually crowned as a sole monarch and handed the symbols of royal authority by the Bishop of Kutaisi and two of her Western lords at the Gelati Cathedral in Western Georgia. But that didn't secure Tamar's power. A major rebellion from powerful aristocratic families in the region tried to unseat her. And what's noteworthy is that she sent two women to negotiate with the rebels on her behalf. What does that tell us about her style as a ruler, Ekaterine? This was a very rational choice, since among the rebels were the husband and the father of the female mediator Skravai Jareli. But at the same time, this choice, I would say, had a deeper root that goes back to the very origins of Christianity. And according to ecclesiastic tradition, Georgia was the country that was converted into Christianity by the only female apostolic saint in Christian world by Saint Nino. And so this theme that I call female priority was actually culminating in Queen Tamar. Now, as we've heard, Tamar wasn't the first queen that had been in Georgia, but she was the first to reign for an extended period in her own right, rather than as a queen consort or through a male regent. So... Was keeping power within the family in the 12th century more important than the monarch's gender? Sandro, what do you think? Yes, of course. The dynasty, by the time Tamar became ruler, had been in charge of the Georgian kingdom for about 200 years. So the entire security of the dynasty was at stake. And this dynasty actually very much emphasised its sacredness, directly associating itself with the king, prophet David. And this dynasty actually monopolized power for a long time in Georgia because approximately 800 years this Bagratid family was in charge of power in in Georgia. 
Well, Queen Tamar's reign is known as the last period of Georgia's so-called Golden Age, which began roughly in the last quarter of the 11th century, during the reign of her great-grandfather, King David IV, or David IV, known as the Builder. Why, Donald, was it considered a Golden Age of Georgia? It's a Golden Age partly because of luck and partly because of the genius of uh, David the Builder. The luck was that the enemies of Georgia who were constantly invading it from the west or the east were either distracted or defeated. The Byzantines were being driven out of Anatolia by various Turkic tribes. And then in Palestine, the Crusaders landed and Muslim forces were concentrated on getting rid of them. And Georgia had a period, not exactly of peace, but in which the opposition was, was weakened. And David the Builder was a military genius. He defeated armies four times the size of his own. The other thing about it was that Georgia became much more multi-ethnic than it had been before or was afterwards uh, that uh, you see on the coins that there are inscriptions in Arabic. David the Builder and his son both went to the mosque as well as to the church. They both spoke some Arabic. They had Armenian connections. It was an extremely tolerant country. They got rid of a great deal of what had been tormenting Georgia, the, the, the major landowners rebelling, trying to put someone else on the throne. They had a system of government which was extremely modern, uh, with a council of ministers, with a, a ritual that ensured that everything worked. They managed to tame the church. Georgia was fortunate in having its own church, and it integrated the bishops by making them ministers in the government. So they had none of the usual conflicts that medieval countries have. And the other thing was the close collaboration between Persian culture and suddenly Georgia broadened up. It had been a very ecclesiastic Byzantine culture full of lives of the saints and uh, hymns. And then suddenly we get this great flow of Persian type uh, narrative poetry, lyrical poetry, heroic prose, uh, fantasy. So in literature, uh, it, it blossomed extraordinarily and the luck lasted until tomorrow. It was not until the Mongols finally came 20 years after Tamar's death that it collapsed. And the country was so large, um, it was about a thousand kilometres from north to south and from east to west, that it could be regarded as an empire. Well, when it came to Tamar, several portraits of her remain, mostly frescoes in Georgia's holy buildings. Today we'd call them official portraits, images of how she wanted to be seen rather than a true likeness. But Ekaterin, what can we learn from these frescoes about Tamar? In all portraits, Tamar is presented in a Byzantine imperial dress showing the political aspiration of the Georgian ruler. She is uh, very richly dressed with embroidery dress of Byzantine style and she has a, a round face, a very round face and with almond-like eyes and very uh, strict and very straight features of the face. And she's really very beautiful. And if you want to see one of the portraits of Tamar, you can find it on the forum website. Well, once she was Georgia's sovereign, inevitably the question arose of who Tamar might marry. It was assumed it would be a man from another ruling family, a common practice to further the political and strategic interests of any dynasty across Eurasia and beyond. It does seem unlikely that Tamar had much say in the choice of her first husband, Yuri Bogolubsky, a prince originally from a small kingdom in what is now Russia. So how briefly did the marriage work out, Alexander? You're correct that Tamar had little say in the choice of her first husband, which once again underscores how quickly the baronial opposition had revived after the death of King George. And while some preferred securing ties with the Byzantine royal family, which would have been part of this long tradition of the Georgian royal dynasty's intermarriage with the Byzantine, imperial family, well, the senior voices at the royal court insisted on uh, Tamar marrying Yuri Bogolubsky, the son of Grand Prince Andrei Bogolubsky of, of Vladimir Suzdal in what is Russia today. Now, Tamar objected to this marriage. Her royal historian writes that Tamar wondered what was the reason for the haste with which this marriage was being arranged and this Yuri was chosen for her. And he quotes her as saying, I know nothing of this foreign man's accomplishments, nor of his leadership or his nature and behavior. Give me some time to get to know him. Well, her wishes were ignored, and in 1185, Yuri and Tamar were in fact married. 
Yuri seemed to show an early promise during expeditions against Anatolian Seljuks, but the marriage turned out to be a complete failure. Tamar's partisans claimed that Yuri was truculent and overbearing adventurer, a habitual drunkard, abusive, cruel, and most damningly, that he was, quote, a homosexual. However exaggerated these claims might be, the relationship between the wife and the husband was clearly not working out, and Tamar aired her grievances at the royal council. So, just two and a half years after the wedding, the marriage was annulled. So, Tamar sent Yuri off to Constantinople, with quite a lot of money as a payoff, it would seem. But, Sandro, Yuri wasn't happy with this arrangement, was he? What did he do next? He returns, and he returns because he knows that he has some support among the Georgian aristocracy. It also seems that there is some kind of support from Constantinople, and we should not forget when they divorce, it's already regime change happens in Constantinople, new dynasty comes into the power, which is actually not very much friendly with the Bagratid family in Georgia. So Yuri counts that with his support among the aristocrats, he will be able to bid for power again. And then what happens is that he, with the support of the Western and Southern Western aristocrats, he is crowned as a king in the royal palace close to Kutaisi, a second biggest city and second capital of a Georgian kingdom. And when Tamar hears the story, according to the narrative, she claims that how anybody else can sit on the throne of Bagratid's then Bagratid family member himself. So for Tamar, it was unimaginable that a person who did not belong to the sacred dynasty could sit on the throne of David, it means that throne of biblical David. So basically she managed to retain power with her supporters. She defeated Yuri and um, he was again uh, exiled uh, outside of Georgia and he managed to return second time, but second attempt was not that successful. After defeating Yuri for the second time, Tamar worked hard to consolidate her hold over an empire which encompassed much of the Caucasus and the eastern Black Sea coasts. But this was no gentle diplomacy. The raids of her armies were just as brutal as those that the Georgians had been subjected to, and the idea seems to have been to seize as much loot and capture as many slaves as possible, and then make the subjugated lands pay annual tribute to the Georgian ruler, with the threat that the Georgian army would come back for more pillaging if the payments were withheld. Georgian chronicles of the time make no secret of this. In fact, they seem to glory in it. Georgians began to devastate Persia from every side, winning amazing victories. Enemy occupants of the Persian fortresses abandoned them when ordered to do so. Every victorious soldier was enriched by the taking of prisoners and the spoils of war. And those among the enemy who managed to escape hid themselves like foxes and crept into holes like moles. Tamar did all this for two reasons. First, so that the heathen who envied each other would fight one another to get back the things which were theirs. And second, to eliminate every source that could generate disloyalty among her subjects. But Queen Tamar was shrewd in the way she divided out the loot brought back to Georgia. She didn't just dole out money and slaves to soldiers and generals, often foreign mercenaries for hire. She also allocated important posts like governorships of subdued foreign towns to local aristocrats. And she also wanted to be seen as a benefactor of the poor. Alex, do we have any evidence to judge the extent and direction of her largesse? Yes, I think we do. But first, let me note that the behavior of Jordan military expeditions abroad was not that different from what the Georgians themselves were subjected to from their enemies. The Georgian punitive expedition, which you have just mentioned, was organized in the wake of the attack of Emir of Ardabil, who had attacked the great Armenian city of Ani, massacred some 12,000 Christians, and burned much of the city down. So the following year, Georgian expedition was organized as a reprisal. Now, the facility with which this raid was carried out, however, did encourage a subsequent expedition on a much wider and daring scale in 1210. Now, as for the loot, Tamar was a great patron of arts, education, as well as monastical centers both within and outside of the kingdom. 
The proceeds of the raids were used to sustain these institutions, renovate old buildings, build new ones. Tamar's reign also witnessed a massive investment in civilian infrastructure, roads, bridges, waterworks. Tamar's reign started with the rebellion of old aristocracy against the people of low rank, whom her father, George, had elevated to high position. Now, this was George's attempt to build his own power base and restrain the power of the old noble families. Of course, the old aristocracy resented this newly powerful upstart. So what Tamar did was she used the proceeds, the loot of the raids, to play these groups against each other by rewarding both sides to ensure that there was certain balance. And I think she was quite successful at this. But in among all this, did she really give much money to the poor? One of the Royal Chronicles specifies that 10% of royal revenues was set aside for charitable distribution. The Chronicles cast her charity as central to Tamar's style of royal governance, to her sense of responsibility to God for the administration of justice in her kingdom. So charity was both a religious virtue and royal responsibility as far as Tamar was concerned. Among the stories we hear about Tamar's life, there is one about a lion cub that she allegedly tamed as a pet. Sandra, can you tell us what we know about this lion and why would Tamar have wanted to be associated with the story? It could be that she tried in this way to demonstrate her power and authority. For instance, like if she is able to control the lion, she can control her subjects. Or if she is able to turn like a wild beast into submissive animal through her persuasive speech or behavior or um, calmness, she is able to also control her subjects. We should also not forget that in the neighboring Byzantine Empire, which very much influenced Georgian political culture, statues of golden lions were used in a ceremony where these uh, golden statues somehow managed to have the uh, voice of the real lion, some kind of advanced technology that Byzantines used. And during a ceremonial reception of the embassies or the uh, rulers, Byzantine emperors in this way somehow demonstrate their power. Also, it probably during the ceremony she used this maybe a uh, lion next to her somehow also a bit intimidating, you know, when you receive some kind of uh, ambassadors and then this wild beast lies next to you who is kind of calm and submissive to her. Probably it was some communication of her image and power and of her ability to control powerful things. Well, whatever the truth about this particular story, the most famous Georgian literary work from that period also features a big cat. But as with so many things concerning Tamar, there's an uncertainty. Was this big cat a panther or a tiger? Find out in the second part of this forum from the BBC World Service in a couple of minutes. This is the BBC World Service, where Linda Presley brings us the second part in a series following people on their gender journeys. I was researching about other experiences and areas. Actually, a lot of those things that trans men tell me are very similar to what I experienced. As a kid, I wanted to be a bi. This is Nayla, 24, born female. She lived as a trans man. And this is her partner, Ellie. I was passing as a man. I was passing so well. I felt like I got so many comments of people telling me that my transition was such a success because they couldn't tell I was trans. I was so shy to tell anyone that I was trans. Nayla and Ellie are both detransitioners, presenting again as female. All these physical changes that I experienced during my transition helped me develop a closer relationship to my body. We're exploring how and why some trans people are returning to their assigned birth gender. Detransitioners, Tuesday at 1.30 and 8 GMT. Still to come on the forum, more on Georgia's colourful medieval monarch, Queen Tamar. How her influence extended beyond the battlefield to enhance the so-called Georgian Golden Age, the building of majestic churches that remain lasting physical monuments to her reign, and the flowering of the arts that produced another legacy, one of Georgia's most important poets. Still with me, my four guests, all experts on Georgia. We'll be back after the news. BBC News with Chris Barrow. China has defended its policy of interning Uyghur Muslims in Xinjiang. It alleged they took part in what it called a comprehensive training programme that's created an innovative workforce. Rights groups and Western countries say the Uyghurs and other minorities are kept in camps and used as forced labour. 
Police have started moving thousands of migrants to a new temporary camp on the Greek island of Lesbos, but many want to leave the island instead. The old Moria camp was destroyed in a fire last week. President Trump has said an effective coronavirus vaccine could be available in the US within weeks, contradicting health officials who say such treatments won't be rolled out until the middle of next year. Joe Biden, his Democratic challenger, said Mr Trump was trying to use the issue for electoral gain. Thousands of people in the southeastern United States are being urged to leave their homes. The region is facing heavy flooding as Tropical Storm Sally makes its way across Georgia and Alabama. Supporters of the Russian opposition leader Alexei Navalny say it's likely he was poisoned at the hotel he was staying in Siberia. Say traces of the Novichok nerve agent have been found on a bottle there. The UN says the election of a new president hasn't improved the human rights situation in Burundi. A special inquiry said there was little space for democracy and perpetrators remained immune from prosecution. Dozens of escaped prisoners are still on the run after a mass jailbreak in Uganda on Wednesday. Only seven of the more than 200 inmates have been captured. Two of them were killed. Clashes have broken out between protesters and security forces in Indian-administered Kashmir after the deaths of four people during a police raid. Three are said to have been militants and one a civilian. BBC News. Welcome back to the Forum from the BBC World Service. I'm Bridget Kendall and today I'm talking about Queen Tamar, the medieval sovereign who reigned during the so-called Golden Age of the Kingdom of Georgia in the Caucasus. My guests are professors Alexander Mikaberidze and Donald Rayfield and researchers Ekaterin Gedevanishvili and Sandra Nikolaishvili. And if you want to learn about other powerful women in history, do head for the Revolutionary Women collection on our website. Let's go back a few years. After her divorce in 1187 from Yuri Bogolyubsky, Tamar was expected to marry again so that she could produce an heir to the throne. And when the news got out that she was in the marriage game again, suitors came from far and wide. Briefly, Alex, tell us about some of the more colourful ones. I don't know how much credence we can give to chronicles for this, but they do tell us that many suitors came for Tamar's hand, both within the broader Caucasus and beyond. One suitor, the Chronicle tells us, was from Ossetia, from North Caucasus, and he was so distraught by being rejected that he died heartbroken on the way back home and was buried at the church of Nicosi. It has been also claimed that the Holy Roman Emperor, who ruled over much of Central Europe at the time, had expressed interest in courting Tamar for his son. Now, among the suitors were also Muslim princes, and what makes them particularly interesting is that the examples of this willing conversion for marriage of a male member of a Muslim ruling family to Christianity are very, very rare. And yet, Georgian Chronicles tells us that Isa al-Din Saltuk, emir of Ar Erzurum, had offered his grandson, Mutafradin, to Queen Tamar with an offer that he would convert to Christianity. Now, Tamar declined it, but she did let him marry her stepsister, who was born from her father's liaison with a concubine. Another suitor, if I can even call him such, was Rukun al-Din Suleiman Shah II, the Seljuk Sultan of Rum, a rather powerful Muslim state in central Anatolia. The Sultan had written a rather condescending letter trying to force a marriage upon Tamar. In fact, his letter opened with this remarkable line, and I quote, Every woman is feeble-minded, unquote. Now, his envoy made things even worse when he added that marriage was not guaranteed unless Tamar converted to Islam, otherwise she would be treated as a concubine. So, the envoy got smacked for such words, while the sultan's bravado only lasted as long as it took Tamar to raise her army and crush the Seljuks at the Battle of Bassiani. In the end, Tamar's powerful aunt, Rusudan, prevailed, and Tamar married her protégé and ward, a man called David or David Sostlan, who may also have been a distant relative of hers. And this new marriage seems to have been harmonious, and Tamar's new husband became a successful military commander, leading Georgian troops to victory in battles both in the Byzantine West and Iranian Southeast. Tamar didn't personally lead troops into battle, but she would have offered very public prayers for their success. Donald, tell us about her relationship with the Georgian church. Well, certainly. But first, about Aunt Rusudan 
and David Soslan. Aunt Rusudan was an extremely experienced woman. She'd been married to two Muslim sultans, both of whom died a few months after the marriage. Uh, her advice was very important. And David Soslan was an ascetic or Alanic uh, prince who was related to the Georgian royal family anyway, and he was brought up at the court. And he, it seems to be in a childhood friend. It's one of those very rare marriages uh, for love uh, that one finds in medieval times. David Soslan was an ideal husband because he was a great military ruler. He could do what Tamar couldn't do, that is, lead troops into battle. And um, he was at the same time extremely tactful. Now, as for the church, what uh, Tamar's practice was, was to follow the army, praying in every church, and to say her last prayers, uh, the last church in Georgian territory, while David Soslan uh, went ahead uh, with the fighting. The church benefited enormously from the wealth or the army brought back. The other thing that Tamar had done was from the very start, when she faced uh, initial opposition as a young queen, she called a church council to try and get rid of the Catholicos who were so hostile to her. And although the church council didn't succeed because they didn't dare get rid of this Catholicos at first, they did reappoint a lot of bishops who were much more favourable. So politically, she manipulated the church and generally found uh, support, and particularly from the new Catholicos. So she had it behind her and the monasteries and the, the clergy were strongly supported. She was clearly, like every Georgian ruler, extremely pious and did a lot of endowments and a lot of building, so that she had a wholehearted support of the, of the ecclesiasts. It was during the time of Tamar's reign that the best-known literary classic of Georgian literature was written, The Knight in the Panther's Skin, by Shota Rustaveli. We'll talk about the author in a moment, but first let's explain who this knight is and why he's wearing a skin that might have belonged to either a panther or to a tiger. Donald, can you help us? It's now been established it was definitely a panther skin. Uh, we meet lonely men uh, wearing a panther skin in, in Persian poetry, I think in Firdosi, a symbol that I wish to be left alone, I'm in mourning. And even Arnold Schwarzenegger couldn't actually wear a tiger skin. Uh, they are very, very heavy. He's a knight who's in desperation because his uh, beloved has been snatched away and he's found weeping by the royal family and uh, they decide that they will help uh, recover the lost girl for him. And a series of adventures makes for a very long and fine poem, which is really a peon to male friendship, the way that the male heroes collaborate in the search and, and the rescue mission. Some of it supernatural, some of it natural. And uh, there were other works of the kind. Um, we know only the author's name and the title. The terrible tragedy is that when the Mongols came uh, 40 years later, so much was destroyed and much of Georgian literature of the time has gone. And Alex, what do we know about the author, Shota Rustaveli? A short answer would be not much. Contemporary sources are largely silent about him. We don't even know his full name. He's assumed to have been born sometime around 1160s. His poem itself provides only a small clue to his identity. In the prologue, the poet identifies himself as certain Rustveli. And in this case, Rustveli is not a surname, but a territorial epithet that can be interpreted as a person of Rustavi, from Rustavi, but also as a person who holds the, the place by the name of Rustavi. In the 1960s, a group of Georgian scholars visited the great uh, Georgian monastery, uh, former Georgian monastery to be precise, of the Holy Cross in Jerusalem where fresco and some surviving documents revealed that Shota Rustaveli served in one of the senior royal positions during Tamar's reign, that he was Mejurchelet Uhutsesi, or high treasurer, and that ultimately he retired to the monastery at an advanced age. There is a wonderful fresco in the monastery showing the only surviving portrait of Shota Rustaveli. Unfortunately, it was vandalized and almost destroyed in 2004, but the good news is that it has been restored recently. And Sandra, very briefly, we heard a bit about the story from Donald, but what do we need to know about the story? What's it about? 
It's about love. It's about court hierarchy. It's about kingship. It's about relationship between humans. There are like two or three imagined countries. It's like Kingdom of Arabia, Kingdom of India, and China. And in Arabia, you have like very similar thing that happens、uh, in Georgia when Georgi, for example, crowns Tamar. You have this kind of similar episode develops when King Rostovan、uh, crowns a、uh, female ruler, and then court officials approach King and tell that you know you shouldn't be worried because doesn't matter. Her, uh, whether she is male or female, she is your daughter, and she can be as good as a male. So there is idea of the kind of gender equality, sort of, and then, then another idea which also Shutaru Stavelli promulgates through his、uh, poem is that the woman has, to, especially noble woman, has to have her word when it comes to marriage, because while. In Arabia, situation is very ideal. In India, situation is not ideal, and exactly the fact that the king's daughter, Nesta Darajan, is not allowed to have word、uh, when it comes to marriage, things start to fall apart, and then a, a huge crisis erupts. So, Rustaveli very much、um, used the current、uh, Georgian situation. I mean, reworked a bit, but、um, inspiration was very much a.、Uh, Georgian courtly affairs, and、uh, his ideas were quite, I would say, revolutionary for the 12th and 13th century. And of course, he's apologetic of Tamar and tries to prove to reader that、uh, um, important is to be virtuous,、uh, wise, and capable ruler, and gender doesn't really matter. In this short extract from the poem, translated by Lynn Coffin, the king's ministers are advising him why his daughter Tinatin should be the next ruler of the country. We also hear about one of the poem's main characters, the warrior Aftandil, and his love for Tinatin. It is best to give the kingdom to her who holds the sun in sway. Although a woman, she is a sovereign ordained by God's decree. We are not flattering you, but even in your absence, agree. Like her radiance, her deeds are as bright as the sunshine to see. Lions' whelps are equally lions. Though female or male they be. Aftandil was a general, the commander in chief's own son. Tall and slim as a cypress was he. His presence, the moon and sun. His visage was as pure as the clearest crystal. Beard. He had none. By Tina Teen's luxurious lashes, he found himself undone. He kept his love madness hidden, lodged deep within him like a dart. Whenever he couldn't see her, though, his roses fading would start. Whenever he saw her fire blazed, his wound more sharply would smart. Love alone should be blamed. Love with the power to break a man's heart. Ekaterin, why is this *The Knight in the Panther Skin* such an important book for Georgians? Without any exaggeration, I will say that Rustaveli became one of the most important symbols of identity for Georgian nation, and even today you will still find some people in Georgia who can recite the complete, very long poem by heart. That some one thousand and six hundred stanza. It's really surprising, and we have the century-old tradition of gifting the poem to the bride as wedding gift. This is true. Tradition that is alive even today, and for example, I bought the、uh, universal edition of the Rustaveli for my small daughter to prepare it、uh, as a wedding gift for her. <laughs> Now, throughout this program, we've been hearing snatches of Georgia's very distinctive music, both liturgical and folk tunes. It's a tradition that goes back to before the reign of Tamar, and is something that Georgians treasure. 
So do we have any idea of what the music in Tamar's time might have been like and what role it played in that society? Georgians uh, historically were known for the polyphonic singing, the multiple voices singing in unison, and um, much of it still survives of it. And anyone who has visited Georgia or who has listened to the recordings of traditional folk singing is familiar to this beautiful uh, harmonies that the Georgian singers can accomplish. So um, I think that's one of the uh, things that we, if, if we had a chance to travel in the blue telephone booth back in time, we would expect to hear. Unfortunately, we don't have the surviving written evidence of what what kind of music it would have been. But I think it would have been similar to the folk singing that we have today, still performed in Georgia. Now, Tama died in 1213, and even though her children were on the whole competent rulers, they weren't able to withstand the onslaught of the nomadic tribes from the northeast, including the Mongols who swept across the steppes from the east. Within a quarter of a century, the Georgian Empire was no more. So, Alex, what legacy did Queen Tamar leave to posterity? I personally feel that even though uh, the, this golden age didn't last as long because of the Mongol invasion, but it is during her reign that the medieval Georgian monarchy really reached its height. And the reason why I feel it is important is because it it offered a sense of unity, it's offered a sense of accomplishment, a gold standard that other subsequent monarchs will try to reach or maintain or re- revive, so to speak, the, the Georgian greatness. And of course, in later centuries, people will look back to this era of prosperity and success and strength longingly, wanting to see it revived. Georgian independence has waxed and waned. In the 20th century, the country was absorbed into the Soviet Union as a constituent republic. But in 1991, when the Soviet Union collapsed, Georgia regained its independence. So, Sandro, how has the perception of Tamar changed since Georgia became a sovereign state again? She became more known to the wide audience than she was before the um, collapse of Soviet Union. But it's not to say that Tamar was unknown during Soviet period. And of course, there was a lot of glorification of the past, and especially her as the most successful ruler after whose death things uh, started to fall apart and country collapsed. So you're saying there was glorification, but was there also a more critical assessment of her as there was new scholarship about her? I wouldn't say so. In especially books written in the 90s and beginning of 2000, it was very in favor of Tamar, and there was kind of a bit of uh, influence of this nationalistic discourse. Um, Tamar is a sort of ideal ruler who actually ruled without any mistakes. Um, so there is, of course, a need to um, be reevaluated very much and to understand that uh, this uh, highly idealized image of Tamar was a consequence of extremely sophisticated uh, royal rhetoric that was pushing the idea of Tamar as an ideal ruler. So we are still very much under the influence of her contemporary and near-contemporary royal rhetoric, which was extremely sophisticated and very successful, which managed to persuade people in her age or after her that um, female ruler uh, could be extremely successful and there was nobody else as successful as she is. Well, the enduring influence of Queen Tamar. I'm afraid that's all we've got time for today. My thanks to Ekaterin Gedivanashvili, Alexander Mikaberidze, Sandro Nikolaishvili, Donald Rayfield, and to reader Cecilia Appiah. And I'll leave you with more of that unmistakable Georgian music. Oh, 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 oh,